Hello everyone, I'm Ruan and welcome to week four of learning computer science in two years. I wanna get straight into this one, so let's look at our timesheet and see how I did. If you look uh, in the timesheet, you'll notice that there's a problem in Monday. Right, I did not actually do anything on Monday. Unfortunately, you know, life happens sometimes and life definitely happened on Monday, which kind of meant I really couldn't get any work done or any studying done. I got a lot of work done. That's that's the life that happens. I did try and catch up. You'd see on Tuesday, I did an extra an hour and then on Wednesday, it went backwards again and ah. You know what, overall, I was still short about three and a half hours for the week. Uh, definitely not ideal. However, I mean, this is this is real life that we're dealing with. Eh? It's not all spreadsheets. So it would be nice to keep to the 30 hours to have the spreadsheet filled out with green blocks all the way. But uh, let's be realistic. Things are going to happen. And you know what, I'm not going to beat myself up about this too much. Ultimately, I did get pretty close to the 30 hour mark, which I think is what matters. I didn't give up. You know, I didn't say, oh, Monday was a terrible day and then just let the rest of the week go. I did try and make up for it. And I think I got pretty close, all things considered. Let's go and talk about the different courses. Let's start with how to code complex data. I actually completed how to code complex data this week and fairly quickly. I think I was able to finish it around Wednesday, actually. Unfortunately, there wasn't any final project. Well, not a final project that I had access to. So in EDX for how to code complex data, you can do a final exam slash project if you are on the verified track. So if you paid the 125 bucks or, or whatever it costs, uh, to be on the verified track, you would have access to that and you could do a final project. Everything is more official and graded. You get your certificate, etc. That's not really what I'm interested in. So I'm not too worried about that. What I did do, though, is I went back to how to code simple data and I did do the Space Invaders final project uh, to some extent. So I can actually show you guys that one. So let's have a look at that and uh, see what happened there. Okay, so this is again in Racket, like all of this has been, and this is all the code. It's quite a lot. I got a bit lazy with some of the uh, the comments, so I left a lot of it out, which might, yeah, be bad. But anyway, let's just see how this thing runs. I don't actually want to show you my code. I just want to show you that it works uh, to some extent. So I'm just going to start a game here, uh, maybe game two. Yeah. yeah. So here we go. You can see it there. <clears throat> so you can you can shoot and you can turn your tank. Whenever you actually land a hit, the space invaders split in two. Uh, the bullets are amazing, so they just go through everything. And uh, this is not the best design because one, you can just hold in the space bar, uh, which makes a <laughs> literal line of bullets. Second uh there's no yeah you see i there's no game over or lose condition i didn't code that i was kind of over it by that time um and then third well the way i have these spaceships being generated is i literally go and i each time i kill one to replace it and uh that is not a great idea right you can you can see why that's not a great idea the game is absolutely well, it's it's chugging hard. So this is not recommended. This is bad. But you know what? I, I thought when I got to this point, I'm like, ah, this is fine. Um, of course, I could play with it some more. I could get the spawning of new spaceships to be a bit more logical or at least make sense in some way. So it doesn't just tank the game. I could also have made a, a losing condition. So if one of the tank, uh, one of the spaceships gets to the bottom of the screen, you lose. And that's not so hard, it's just basically the Y position that you have to account for of any one of the invaders. So it's not difficult, I just, I was kind of over it, right? So because I finished complex data when I got, went back to this one, and it was kind of simplistic, and it's just a lot of work, or not a lot of 
learning almost. I guess I did learn a few things, maybe, but it wasn't as complicated, so I didn't really feel into it. But I got that far, at least, right? That's, that's better than nothing. But anyway, so that's how to code simple data and complex data completely finished. I'm not going to go back to that uh, if I don't need to. Maybe there is some need for going back there, but I'm not going to do any more problem sets or project or anything of that nature. I'm done. Next, let's talk about programming languages part A. So programming languages part A is then obviously because I was able to finish by Tuesday or Wednesday roughly, uh, I did get quite a bit of work done in programming languages. I actually managed to finish the first week, which is like the introductory week, and the second week of content or, or syllabus or whatever you want to call it, right? I finished two weeks, technically, of lectures. And then I started with the first assignment. And I kind of almost finished the first assignment or first homework or problem set. A few things that I want to note with this new course. I was able to go quite fast because as it turns out, week one and week two did rehash a lot of things that I was already fairly familiar with from how to code simple and complex data. So it wasn't that difficult. I must say we did get very far though. So by the end of week two, it, you know, we almost caught up with where we were in how to code. So there's definitely going to be a much faster progression and I'm very happy that I did how to code first because otherwise I would be uh, yeah, not doing very well at this point. I do want to make a note on the structure of the course. So it's differently, it's differently structured than how to code. In fact, it's more similar to what CS50 does, right? So you have a lot of course of a lot of lectures and then you have big problem set that you need to do at the end of the week. So that's kind of what CS50 does as well. Um, how to code, like I said, it has this do a bit, watch a bit, do a bit, watch a bit, right? Um, in this one, it really seems like, although it's split into little um, segments, the videos, you really just kind of have to watch through all of the segments for a specific week, and then you tackle a big problem set, and that's what you do. So welcome change. I kind of like that way of working. Another thing I should mention is that again, this course, or at least part A of programming languages, is again taught in a language that I've never heard of. This time it's taught in standard ML or SML, which, yeah, it's new to me. This is the first time I heard about it. Look, it's not, it's not crazy uh, complicated. It's actually in a lot of ways more intuitive than Racket especially because they use infix notation instead of prefix notation like Racket does. And uh, if you don't know what that means, it's basically prefix notation is when you have the, the operator and then the two values. Let's say you have a addition sum, or yeah, if you want to do addition, you would literally in Racket, you'd write plus and then number one, number two. So it's plus five, three is eight. Uh, and this one, infix is five plus three is eight, right? That just makes sense. Uh, that's how we write, that's how we think. So in that sense, it's much more intuitive. Also, you don't have to write anywhere near the same amount of parentheses that you did in Racket, which, which is amazing because Racket got confusing <laughs> very quickly, especially because there were just so many parentheses and you would often forget one and it blows up your code or it's, it's just annoying. It's a lot of tech to, to, um, to keep track of. It's not the end of the world, but it is a lot. Okay. But that's basically everything on the programming front. Let's like take a look at what calculus did. Okay. So for calculus, I completed all the coursework for calculus 1A. That means that I spent roughly 30 hours to complete all the coursework. Now I basically have you know, if you look at the amount of hours that is allocated to calculus one, I have, I have 50 hours roughly to just do problem sets and maybe work out a couple exams. Now I'm not going to get there. Definitely not. I'm not going to spend another 50 hours on calculus one. A I will probably spend another two weeks or so. So maybe another 20 hours if I had to guess somewhere, somewhere around there. 
uh, just to get the practice in, right? I do believe that you get better at mathematics by doing more mathematics. So I'm going to practice as much as I can, do every single problem set. They are quite long, so that will keep me busy for a while. And then do the exams as well, which will definitely keep me busy. I also spent a lot of time just summarizing some of the concepts, you know, so that I have them readily available while I'm doing these problem sets or exams. But uh, that's my plan for calculus. It's really went much faster than I anticipated. Uh, but I'm not over. It's not over yet, right? I'm not done. Done. I want to really understand the stuff. I want to be able to do differentiation as if it's a, you know, just second nature before I move on to integration. And uh, that is basically everything I wanted to give you guys an update on for this week. Thank you so much for watching this video and please click the like button, leave a comment, subscribe, all those good YouTube things. I really appreciate it and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.